Hello. <laughs> We've been on the air. Uh, the Atheist Experience has been on the air for uh, for over 12 years now, believe it or not. I looked it up. Um, and people, uh, you know, we, uh, we receive a lot of emails. In fact, we've been receiving a lot more emails uh, since we went international, so to speak, uh, by being on the internet and having a lot of people just find us by word of mouth. Um, and uh, there are a lot of things that people ask us in email which, uh, which we don't always grant. Uh, in particular, one of the things that, uh, that people have been asking for a long time is, when are you guys going to have a Christian on the show? Um, the, uh, they have different reasons for asking that. Uh, so, some, uh, some people would like to see us have an actual debate, and some people just think that we should have uh, more theists on as a way of providing balance. Um, we've basically, I think, been pretty consistent in our answer, and uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the sneakiness of this transition has not worked too well with the camera positioning. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, so to continue to build this up, <laughs> hey, look, there's another person here suddenly. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Russell. Uh, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Fine. Uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for uh, having me, Russell. Nice to have me, Jim. I was going sure. to draw out this introduction longer. But, Something dramatic. And... <laughs> yeah, but basically, uh, this is Kyle Miller, executive pastor. Oh, look, they even put up the title already. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Kyle Miller is the executive pastor of the Great Hills Baptist Church, and uh, this is the first time in the atheist experience history that we've actually decided to try some something like that. And uh, I'm really glad that you agreed to come on here. And I Thanks hope you me. haven't felt uh, too much like being in the lion's den oh, no. sitting in the audience. I've been looking forward time. to this. Okay. We tried to do it in December. It didn't work. Glad to be here in January. Yeah, that's right. Great. Um, so I think we sort of loosely agreed to talk about the problem of evil. Um, so I, I guess what I was going to say about the problem of evil is basically, you know, I'm an atheist, so uh, I don't... Uh, you know, I don't believe in any gods, but when somebody asks me about the problem of evil, what I generally say is, I don't think that in itself is a good reason not to believe in God. Um, so, um, even if I were to get you to agree that, say, the problem of evil was a completely sound and valid argument, uh, the only thing that I could hope to prove is that a world where there's evil, and that's however you want to de describe that, mm -hmm. uh, isn't compatible with a god who, is, uh, who has all three properties of being omnipotent, omniscient, and completely good. Um, but... So, so that's the way the Christian God is often described. But the Christian God obviously isn't the only game in town. I mean, uh, you know, there have been thousands of gods described throughout history, and I think everybody here would agree that uh, the vast majority of them, or in our case, all of them, were made up by people. Um, so, for instance, you know, you take the Greek pantheon, for example. Uh, the, Greek, the Greek gods are, are some gods with very human-like characteristics. Uh, they live in a specific place on Earth, and they get jealous of each other, and they party, and they, uh, and they do stuff. And um, if I was going to, if I went to Darfur like you, and I uh, were to ask a question like, why doesn't uh, Dionysus, the Greek god of wine, help uh, relieve this human suffering, that wouldn't make any sense because uh, Dionysus would probably be off drunk somewhere and would be interested in doing something else. Um, so I think that in the case of Dionysus, for instance, the problem of evil isn't really a meaningful issue because uh, the way that God's described isn't consistent right. with somebody who would care about their being okay. evil. I would rather that somebody come from your perspective where your God that I don't believe in uh, <laughs> would tell would be the kind of person who you would think would tell you to go and make some concrete useful contribution to people in some way. Uh, but ultimately, I think the difference between the way that people approaches their God uh, approach their God comes down to a question of what their character is like it will be a reflection of what kind of God they think there is. Yes. So uh, I can say a couple of good points about that. For one, I would mm -hmm. that wouldn't be how I describe 
what I believe in God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. And in particular, um, what I believe is that God's holiness is holiness that actually kind of fuels love for us. And then that love, that love for us, in spite of the, I like to describe it as the computer virus of sin. <laughs> um, different definition than you shared a few minutes ago, but oh, okay. we call it sin. Right. And uh, that's what motivated him, send his son Jesus, die on the cross, pay for our sins. And it has mm -hmm. to be accepted on faith. And it's different than, as y'all would reason, kind of epistemologically, not evidence, uh, not proven, but, you know, but faith. And that, and that there is, even in that context, nothing in the scripture that says that th this loving God is going to prevent suffering to happen to anyone. In fact, Hebrews 5, 8 says that although Jesus was God's son, even Jesus learned obedience by the things which he su suffered. Mm -hmm. So even Jesus, who didn't have any sin, we believe, had learned obedience, went through training. I like to use it in sports. I'm a coach. Even Jesus had to be trained in hard times that went happened in his life. And so it's a, it's a, it's. So what about gratuitous suffering? Uh, how do you reconcile that with a loving God? I mean, gratuitously, like well, well, I mean, not, not all, not all suffering is man-made. After all, I mean, there yeah. are things I mean, like, like floods and earthquakes, which I mean, disease, you know. disease. Sure. Um, <clears throat> natural disasters, things like that. Right, mm. and I think that uh, people can and do and should work to uh, reduce that stuff. But I mean, really, that's been around for a really long time before people, I mean, you know, there were thousands of years before people were in a position to do something about that. Right. But two thoughts, one is that mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says like it rains on, a, rains on the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think natural disasters happen and on all these things, I will say, for me, it's a, it's a great comfort that I don't have to, on my little three-pound head-top computer, I don't have to understand all this with what I believe about God. But I do like working on it, you know, <coughs> thinking about it, praying about it, talking about it with great people like you all. And that natural disasters happen, and that's part of the stuff that, that we have to deal with, like, like um, tsunami, but a tsunami different than genocide. A tsunami mm -hmm. is just tectonic plates causing thousands of deaths versus genocide. Although which to the victims, causing. there's not a big difference, yeah. I would imagine. No, no. Yeah. And then also, um, I would say about our bodies, we have frail bodies and uh, bodies, they wear down after a while mm -hmm. and things happen. Or they don't wear down after a while that, you know, a baby or a child has cancer, mm -hmm. you know, or a car accident happens, which isn't anybody's fault, you know, no, yeah. not a drunk driver. But there are lots of things that are hard to explain. And as a counselor, now for 25 years, I've been faced with this. It's, for me, it's not theoretical mm -hmm. that I've been faced with the, many, many of these things, only most recently genocide yeah. and the difficulties. And so it's, I like to acknowledge people. I don't have all the answers. I'm not sure if I have, you know, any of the answers for me. Jesus is the answer. But, but in terms of actually being able to express it to people, uh, my heart is just to be with them and sit with them mm -hmm. like I did in, in Darfur. And just kind of be with them and say, I'm, I'm, I don't understand what happened. I'm so sorry it happened. And it's yeah. just, tell people it's important to express that and give them some tools f so they can talk about it with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how you personally come to grips with, because I assume you believe that your God is all good. Uh, yeah, holy, first and foremost, holy. Okay. The Bible says actually Wait, holy, holy, holy. Is there a difference between, yeah. Well, first and foremost, it doesn't say, I like to point out the Bible says, you know, God is and holy, and holy doesn't only secondarily means that not sinning. Okay. But holy just means whole and complete. Like we use the word universe, like okay. one universe. And so God is whole and complete, no beginning, no end. And so in that way, loving, yes, good, yes, 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 yes to all that. But I like to point and out, all, it's holy first. The other first. two things, all powerful and all yes. knowing. All the omnis, all right. the omnis, yes, okay. Okay. all the omnis. And that, uh, but that as such, he never said, from what I read in the Bible, that even though he is holy, good, and loving, that doesn't never is translated that there's not going to be consequences. In fact, what we believe about sin is that Adam's, Adam and Eve's sin, us having in, in inherent sin, computer virus, as I put it, best metaphor mm -hmm. I can use, is not that we're all horrible and evil and just wicked, but that we have a propensity to do the wrong thing. Sin, I like to say, is us trying to meet our needs apart from God in self-destructive ways and ways that really, in the end, aren't good for us. They don't fill the hole. They, they actually create a bigger hole my definition. And so back to the thing you're saying about the reconciliation, I think for me, I had an earlier start on it because where I was growing up, say for example, when I was in kindergarten in India, mm -hmm. not only did we have, was there a war going on in Pakistan, you know, air raid shelter in my kindergarten, 
but also we drive to kindergarten, we'd see you know, dead people on the road. Mm -hmm. And so I think from early on, 1969, I was in Vietnam during the war. I was working on these things with my you, parents. You were in Vietnam, but not as, a, as an American. Is that what you're? Yes. No. No. I was in Vietnam. I was a nine-year-old boy. Yeah. Okay. My parents. So you were. At, you just actually happened to be there during a time of war. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Several places. So. So all that to say, my own personal context, I've been working on reconciling these things, growing up in Asia and seeing terrible stuff, and then as a counselor, and now in this, this other you know thing like going to, uh, Darfur, and I, and I like that you had an Afrocentric, um, motto uh, logo up there with Africa, Africa in the middle. I've been to Africa three yeah. times now.